The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Clearview Cyclones. On today's show, we're going to make this here jewelry box because I'm an Italian from Jersey and I've got a lot of jewels. Hit it! Gary Rogowski is an accomplished woodworker, educator, and author. He literally wrote the book on joinery, and he teaches classes at his school in Portland, Oregon, called the Northwest Woodworking Studio. When Gary emailed me and told me he'd be in the area, I jumped at the opportunity and said, come on down to the shop, spend as much time as you can here, and let's build something together. And that's what this is. Now, of course, we couldn't finish the entire project in the short two days that we had together, but we got most of it done, and then I filled in the blanks at the end and hopefully did his jewelry box design some justice. Right now, if you want to build this project, you can go to our website and download the SketchUp plans and the cut list. And here's Gary to tell you all about this jewelry box. This project was a commission some years ago for a friend of mine uh, who wanted a gift for a surgeon who had done some work on his, on his mom. It was done in the style I was working in it at the time, a sort of an oriental flair to it, but utilizes some very simple techniques <clears throat> on the bandsaw that we need to set up first before we launch into our, uh, our good wood. So let's do some setup on the uh, bandsaw and make some practice cuts first. It's critical that the practice pieces are the same width as our actual box side pieces at two and a quarter inches wide. The fingers are laid out in roughly even thirds, and the fence is set to cut along the outer line. We'll cut the mortise board first, making one cut and then flipping it over for the second cut. Now we need to cut a shim that fits snug into that bandsaw kerf cut. The table saw and a little trial and error should eventually yield the perfect shim. Rather be a little, little tight than too loose. Shim goes here, we make the next, next two cuts. Now these cuts are for the adjoining tenon board. When you put the two boards together, you should see something like this. With the outer pieces of one board cut away and the inner piece of the other board cut away, the tenon should slide right into the mortise. Let's cut away the waste so that we can do an actual test fit. Now it's a bit snug, but that's always better than being too loose. Before cutting the joints on the actual work pieces, Gary cleans up each face with a smooth plane. And, and look at the difference in the color. Now I sand, don't get me wrong, but if your hand plane's working nice, there's a clarity of cut that's just unmatched. He then establishes the shoulder line on each piece using a cutting gauge set to about a sixteenth of an inch over the thickness of the work pieces. This is going to result in fingers that sit proud of the sides. White pencil makes the line easier to see. Now back to the bandsaw, we'll start with the mortise cuts first. It's a good idea to do them all at once, and be sure to mark the waist so you don't get confused. Now with the shim in place, we can make the matching tenon cuts. Before cutting away the waist, Gary uses a chisel to clearly establish the shoulders, making for easy chiseling later on. Now you don't want to cut directly on the line, but the closer you get, the less work you have to do later. For the tenon pieces, Gary uses one of the side pieces as a makeshift fence. That's a nice fit. That's a great fit. It's the hardest thing is cutting the shim. Really, that's the hardest part of this joint. Now back at the workbench, we'll use a chisel to clean up the shoulders. Only go about halfway and then flip the board and chisel from the other side. This ensures that the shoulders are nice and even on both sides. The tenon pieces are done a little bit differently, paring in from the outside edges. A quick test fit and everything looks pretty good. Now we can make our bottom panel grooves using the router. Using stop blocks on both sides allows us to make a stopped groove in the mortise pieces. And the tenon pieces just get a simple through groove. Now we can measure for the bottom panel and cut the plywood to size. Instead of using felt or flocking for the box bottom, Gary likes to use decorative paper. The paper is adhered to the plywood bottom using water-based finish. Simply apply a good wet coat to the ply and then a nice wet coat to the paper. Press the two together and work out any bubbles. Then apply more water-based finish to the top of the paper. A wood block can then be used to press the paper nice and flat. Don't worry too much about the wrinkles as they only add to the leathery look of this paper. 
The paper is then wrapped around the edge, and the panel is left to dry. Once completely dry, the extra paper can be trimmed right to the edge. And a test fit confirms the panel size. Before we can do the assembly, we need to add a slight bevel to the fingers, which is done with a block plane and a chisel. Because the bottom panel is so snug, there's really no need to glue it in. We'll just focus on gluing the fingers. With a few clamps and some calls, the box comes together nicely. So we've got the box glued up. Time to work on the lid. Uh, Mark has, thankfully, glued up our, our panel. We've got a nice cortisone walnut panel for the top, but we need to hold that top flat and breadboard ends are the, they're a nice way of doing it. Not the best way, but they're a nice way of doing it. At the router table, we can now cut the stopped grooves for the breadboard's blinds. Once again, a stop on each side gives us consistent results. The panel is done with a similar setup, and we'll get to that full quarter inch depth over the course of a couple passes. To help keep the breadboards nice and tight, Gary uses the smoothing plane to create a sprung joint. By putting a slight dip into the breadboard end, we'll be able to apply pressure and glue it at the center while forcing the ends to remain nice and tight. When the two breadboards are put together, you should see a slight gap in the middle. Now to make the loose tenons. We cut some walnut stock so it fits into the groove perfectly. The grain needs to be oriented across the joint, so we'll cut a few pieces to approximate size at the table saw. The splines are then glued into place all the way across the top panel. Once dry, the splines are trimmed to the perfect length all at once at the table saw. Now to attach the breadboard, glue is added only in the center about 4-5 to five inches, and that allows the panel to expand and contract with changes in humidity. Because the breadboards are sprung joints, all we need is a single clamp at the center to pull them nice and tight to the panel. To help reinforce the finger joints and to add some extra pizzazz, we'll use some bamboo skewers as dowel pins. They'll be cut to size at the bandsaw. A brad point bit allows me to drill precise holes, and a toothpick is perfect for getting glue into that tiny space. The pegs are then hammered into place. The excess is then trimmed with a flush trim saw, and the surface is sanded smooth. Now to install the hinges, everything we need to know about mortising for the hinge leaf will come from the hinge itself. The hinge is draped over the end, with one of the leaves folded onto the back surface, I then carefully trace around the hinge with an X-Acto knife. The depth of the mortise will be marked using a cutting gauge. Now the entire mortise will be made using chisels. I'll start by establishing the outer borders, carefully chiseling into the knife line. For the sides, chopping right on a line would actually push that chisel back, so I'll relieve a little bit of material in front of the line first, and then I could safely chop directly on the line. Now I can set the chisel in the cut line for the depth. As long as I keep my chisel level, it should create a nice flat bottom for our hinge. All that's left to do is clean up the corners and test fit. For the lid, I'm going to transfer the locations directly using an X-Acto knife. The marks are tiny, but they allow me to place a square on the edge and extend that line with the knife. Then I use the hinge itself to establish the back line. The depth is set with the cutting gauge, and the mortise is chiseled out just like before. As a final treatment for the top, I'll chamfer the edges of the breadboard using a chamfering bit. And that small little inside chamfer is done with a chisel. Now the box needs some feet. I'll take some 3 quarter inch square stock and file a chamfer on all four sides of the end. A stationary sander would make quick work of it if you have one. With a stop block in place, I then cut the foot from the blank and glue it to the bottom of the box. I'll then repeat this process three more times for the remaining feet. 
Now back to the hinges. It's a good idea to pre-drill for the screws and a self-centering bit like this one does a great job. Now these Brusso hinges come with a handy steel screw that you can use to establish the threads in the hole, and that prevents you from stripping the decorative brass screws that we'll use later. A little wax here helps as well. Because the top is so thin, I need to trim the brass screws to fit. The process of pre-drilling is the same for the box side of the hinge, only the screws are left at full length. Now we can attach the lid and see how everything lays out. If the edges feel consistent all the way around, our work with the hinges is done. Now it's a good idea, but totally optional, to make a set of dividers for the interior of the box. I'll cut a few pieces of scrap to width and length and assemble a very simple grid work. The cross pieces will be held in shallow dados, cut with a couple passes at the table saw. Notice I'm using two stop blocks to make sure that the dados are cut accurately and consistently. Because the blade leaves a little bit of a ridge surface, I'll use a router plane to clean up the bottom. The result should be a nice snug fit that drops right into the box. The box has a decorative handle that I'll cut out of some ebony. I tried to copy the shape from Gary's original using some French curves. Before cutting the curves, I drill the bottom of the handle blank for dowels, and that's going to help us attach the handle to the lid. Complementary holes are drilled into the lid itself. The handle is then cut to shape at the bandsaw and smoothed at the oscillating spindle sander. The final shaping and smoothing is done by hand. Now the finish we're going to use today is Waterlocks. It's a very high quality but pretty expensive wiping varnish finish. And the way that I'm going to apply it results in something that I think is perfect for a jewelry box. It's fairly light duty but super easy to apply. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper into the world of wiping varnish finishes, you can check out my DVD, Simple Varnish Finish, at the Wood Whisperer store. Alright, let's get to that jewelry box. To apply the finish, I'll use nothing more than blue shop towels. I wipe on a generous amount since the raw wood is going to soak it right up. Don't forget to finish the bottom. And here's a cool tip. If you don't have a lid for your secondary container, you can just use your glove to lock out the air and protect the leftover finish. The next day, I give everything a light sanding with 320 grit paper and then vacuum the dust and apply a second coat. This one goes on faster and easier since the wood is partially sealed. The goal is to just wet the surface and wipe away the excess. Now for the third and final coat, I'll employ a cool trick. Instead of sanding the dried finish and then applying a new coat, I'm going to apply the final coat with a 500 grit sanding pad. That'll smooth the surface while creating a little bit of a slurry that helps fill the pores. The excess is wiped away, and the resulting surface is incredibly smooth. The internal grid work is then glued together, and the handle is glued to the lid. Well, it's a seemingly simple box with a lot of different techniques involved in making it, but you don't have to do all of those. There's lots of different ways you could join those sides. You don't have to do breadboards for the top. You could really simplify this box or complicate it all you want. That's a great thing about boxes is they're really a great exploration of woodworking techniques. Now, I'd like to thank Gary for stopping by this shop. It was a great experience and a thrill for me to have one of my personal woodworking heroes in my own shop. Really awesome experience. So thanks everybody for watching. Thanks Gary for hanging out with me, putting up with me, and uh, download the plans for this. Build one for yourself. Thanks for watching.